Hello everyone, I'm Matthew, I'm the lead pastor here at Cedar Ridge and I want to welcome you again to our service this morning. Thank you so much for joining us, it's great to be together. Uh, we're in week two today of our series On the Trail with Jesus and uh, we're going on this virtual hike uh, on a present day trail in northern Israel um, which uh, goes from Jesus' hometown of Nazareth to a town called Capernaum on the Sea of Galilee, which is where he moved later in life. And just to sort of orient, uh, orient us to that geography, um, here's a map of Israel in, in Jesus' time. You'll see in the um, top right there uh, the Sea of Galilee. Um, and a little bit further over to the west, you'll see Nazareth, where the trail begins, sort of in the top middle part of that map. Um, and then to sort of locate us in the present day, here's the trail, um, the Jesus Trail as it's called, um, begins in Nazareth in the west and then heads northeast up to Capernaum on the Sea of Galilee. Today we're going to cover the section from Cana to La Vie. And um, you may remember that Ruth left us in Cana last week uh, talking about the uh, famous miracle of Jesus turning water into wine. So we're going to trek along from there to La Vie. Um, it's a really beautiful uh, section of the trail. Um, lots of beautiful countryside, lots of rich agriculture, agricultural land. Um, not so many uh, specific stop-off points as perhaps some of the other, um, other parts of the trail. You know, not so many um, uh, aspects or locations on the trail that are specifically necessarily related to stories about Jesus. But Jesus would um, inevitably have walked at least parts of this trail with his followers. Um, uh, perhaps many times and um, you know of course this journey is not we're going on the journey not only to try and um, sort of root ourselves in the history and geography and culture of the area and, and, and sort of reflect perhaps in, in, in light of those um, freshly on the teachings of Jesus but um, we also see um, this journey um, as a metaphor for our own spiritual lives our own uh, spiritual journey so um, we're going on this trail together um, we're going to take a quick look at the trail now and you may remember from last week that we've um, been um, going along with uh, Betsy and Philip who are two young people that uh, made a decision to walk the trail um, as realistically as they could. They even dress up in first century Palestinian uh, garb, um, which makes them look a little bit eccentric. You know, they look like they may have uh, escaped from a Christmas pageant or something like that. And they certainly get a few uh, interesting looks from people along the way. But they're just trying to root themselves in that history. And um, as they go along, as we'll see in, in, the, in the clip from today, um, they, they try to um, do it the way Jesus would have done it, as close as possible. Not just the way they dress, but in terms of the food they eat and how they prepare and cook that food um, and, and live the kind of simple life that uh, Jesus would have lived with his followers. So let's take a look at the trail now and, uh, and then we'll um, uh, draw some conclusions and some applications for uh, the, the journey that they're on. But the whole trail up to Ilania, we went through this kind of some back country and it was just beautiful out. It felt like you were out in the middle of nowhere. There were no sounds except wilderness sounds and um, huge fields of green grass. And it was just a really beautiful experience. One of the best feelings was arriving at Ilania Goat Farm and uh, near Golani Junction where we're staying the night. The sun was at a perfect angle, the grass was green, there are flowers and gardens everywhere and goats and frogs and um, somebody driving their sheep home at night. It just felt like a moment of paradise, you know, you're tired and your feet are, um, are dirty and you come to this place where there's soft green grass, you know, like in Psalm 23. In just a few minutes we need to start a fire so that we can make supper for um, the crew here and ourselves. Last night we had brown lentil stew, tonight we're going to have red lentil stew with bulgur and um, some goat cheese from this amazing goat <laughs> farm and bread from a local bakery in uh, Nazareth. It's, it's like an example and uh, I think uh, uh, yesterday they had a chance to see how things uh, used to be. The, those days. And, and those days exactly and uh, I don't think it was, it was that easy. Correct me if I'm wrong. When you go in the costume, I think uh, you feel different. You are not a hiker, you're part of a story. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I think this is what Jesus is all about, uh, to be part of a story of what Jesus uh, done uh, 2,000 years ago. Um, and it's very exciting, even for us as a Jews. 
to see this experience and these people that are um, want to go, to go in Jesus' footprints. Um, don't give up. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, so Jesus loves eating the product of agriculture uh, and drinking the product of agriculture. We saw um, last week how he turns water into wine. I think Jesus really enjoys food and drink and especially eating and drinking with his friends. Um, he also ate and drank with his enemies. I mean, that was part of the culture back then. Um, eating and drinking together was a sense, it was a, a, a form of community. But um, you get the impression Jesus along this trail would have stopped off and eaten um, when he was able to. Um, we, we get the, the, I think in this um, uh, video that we saw, the sense of that was a bit of a struggle at times. Uh, we'll get to that. Um, because, you know, preparing food and cooking food wasn't as easy as it is today. Um, but Jesus really enjoyed it and experienced community and experienced God through that community um, uh, because of his connection to the agricultural world. Um, secondly, nature shows us that we're not in control. Um, Jesus would have been subject to uh, weather patterns, uh, floods and winds and um, you know, earthquakes, destructive forces that can um, can uh, really um, upset uh, the culture and upset the situation for a lot of people and, and inhibit agriculture. Um, so there would have been uh, scarcity of food at times. Jesus would have known what it was like to go hungry. Uh, and, you know, there was this sense that you can't just take everything for granted. I mean, we're, again, somewhat buffered from that right now, I think, in our modern world. Uh, we can protect ourselves from the elements. We can um, uh, have food, different types of food uh, out of season. Uh, there's, for many of us, we have an abundance of food, easy access to food. That's not true for everybody, of course, in this country or around the world. Um, but in, in our modern life, we might be lulled into a full sense of security and, and, and we have the illusion of control. But when we think about it, big picture, global warming and the kind of wildfires and um, uh, storms and flooding that we, we're experiencing, they just show us that we're not in control of nature. Um, it's an illusion. And likewise with food, there are times when we do experience scarcity. For instance, beginning of the lockdown of the pandemic last year, um, uh, there was a rush on food, but people were worried that wouldn't be enough food. So interestingly, the human response to scarcity is fear and, uh, uh, and, and a move to try and control our circumstances by hoarding food rather than thinking about sharing it and making sure that everybody has enough. Um, so, you know, we, we're, we may think we're in control and we, our separation from nature and agriculture may give us the illusion of control, but actually nature tells us that we're not in control and actually that's a good thing because that makes us more interdependent it makes us dependent on god for provision it makes us dependent on one another um you know other people who prepare food who grow food who harvest food we, we when we're connected to it rather than buffered from it we see the fact that we need one another um, and I, I, I'm a shameless plug here for the uh, for our, our community farm. Um, uh, this coming Friday, we have another sangria night. Come on out to the farm, either on a Friday or on a Thursday night um, from 6 to 8 p.m. Um, and experience what it's like actually growing food. And, and um, the, you know, the, the, the joy of that, the struggle of that, um, we have a real live opportunity to connect with God in that way and in a way that would have been much more like the experience of Jesus than um, our modern day experience. And then thirdly, um, nature speaks to us about partnership with God. In other words, we're, we, agriculture is this incredible partnership with life, isn't it? Where um, the, you know, the, the mystery of life is um, all around us, things growing, things reproducing. Uh, but we've been able to work with that and cultivate certain crops that didn't exist, uh, you know, because we've adapted them before humanity. Um, we've adapted them to our needs and we're co-creators with God. We, we're working in partnership with God um, and creation. And um, that's something um, that Jesus was always talking about, partnership with God, inviting us to work with God, that God believes in us. God trusts us. God wants us to be agents of love, peace and hope, to bring renewal, to bring healing to the world. We get to do that work. And that's a beautiful thing. Um, so um, all this sort of leads to the conclusion, I think, that God loves the physical world. God loves the natural world. And, uh, you know, rather than it being a sort of a secondary thing to some separate spiritual world. And in, and in fact, some some religious thought would suggest that the world's going to be destroyed. God really doesn't like it and will destroy it one day. Um, uh, whereas I, I don't think scripture speaks about that. In, in Romans chapter eight, the Apostle Paul, says, Apostle Paul says, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up until the present time. In other words, um, 
it's about renewal. Something new is coming. It, it, it hasn't come to fruition yet. Nature isn't, uh, it's like it hasn't fully blossomed. And um, the, the future um, looks like a future of renewal and, and construction and uh, partnership. Um, in the book of Revelation, that sort of, you know, uh, um, an apocalyptic vision, let's call it. It's a, it's a poem, it's, it's metaphorical. I think we've got to be careful about taking it all literally. Uh, but in chapter 21, it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Uh, very often, Revelation is, is where people go to try and work out what's going to happen at the end of the world. Well, it looks like it's renewed, it's restored, it's not destroyed. It's, there's, there's something um, uh, uh, beautiful and, and recreative that happens within this physical world. So God loves the physical world and Jesus was very connected to it, experienced God through it and shared that with other people as well. Um, let's talk a little bit about the Roman road. Um, so here's a, um, a road that Jesus may well have walked on. It's been excavated and, and the Romans, of course, were famous for their roads. Um, they, it's incredible technology. They were able to build these roads that meant um, uh, people could travel along them. There, there was all kinds of commerce and trade that could happen and generation of wealth. Uh, it really transformed the culture around them, um, ex exchange of ideas. It was, it was just, um, you know, many positive things happened through the Roman roads. Um, and they were, um, but there's a sinister aspect to it. There's a, there's a, there's a, a dark aspect to these roads because we know they're part of the Roman Empire. Um, Ruth talked about the Roman Empire last week and its will to dominate and control and suppress. And anybody who, who um, uh, rebelled against it was put down brutally. And these roads, in some respects, for me at least, they re represent um, technology that was used to, um, uh, to oppress. It's like, a, if you like, a blight on this idyllic uh, countryside. And, and the roads were constructed in very efficient, utilitarian kinds of ways. They went from A to B in a straight line, primarily. Here's a, here's a picture of another road, Roman road in Great Britain, actually, because they built them all over their empire. Um, and they, would, they, they were very efficient, but they didn't cooperate with nature. They, they um, subjugated nature. They, they uh, you know, they, they, they were just like a... a, a, a a blight on the surface of nature. Um, and we also know, of course, that um, they weren't, their intention wasn't really to create wealth for everybody and to spread wonderful ideas. It was to spread Roman ideas and, and primarily to transport armies around their empire so that they could keep control of people and subjugate people. And so these, these, the Roman road represents the closeness, I, I would say, of um, injustice and oppression that Jesus experienced. Many of us, not all of us, many of us might be um, somewhat buffered from injustice. It, we may not experience that firsthand. We read about it, we hear about it, we, um, but we, we're not necessarily experiencing it in the way that Jesus did. And so we're just going to explore that a little bit um, as we want to walk this trail with Jesus which, um, and experience the things that Jesus experienced as we walk in his footsteps. We're just going to explore that a little bit in the community of Ilania. Now, Ilania, which is the point where they stop and they, they, they cook some dinner and they're on the goat farm and, and the eco lodge. Um, the community of Ilania is, is a really interesting one because it's set in this idyllic scene and there's a, you know, and even the way it's portrayed in that video is somewhat idyllic. But this, I think it represents in many ways the tensions of the idyllic natural world and uh, the Roman road, uh, imperialism and suppression and oppression, the, 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 um, the dark side of humanity, if you like. Um, the, um, what happened in uh, the early part of the 20th century uh, was that people started um, uh, migrating from primarily uh, Russia and Kurdistan, Jewish people who, many of whom were fleeing oppression, and they established a community uh, which they, they called Sejira in um, this, what is now Ilania. Um, and that community, it was, it, it's now about 300 people. It's never been really huge. It's one of the first settlements in the Lower Galilee. Um, and it was um, established on land bought by um, Baron Edmund James de Rothschild, famous French uh, Jewish person who, um, you know, from a very famous family, a banker, had, had a lot of money and bought up a lot of land in Palestine, um, especially with a view to 
uh, creating a home for Jewish people who were fleeing all sorts of things in the early part of the 20th century. Eventually, um, the land was transferred to the Jewish Colonization Association. Um, and it, the community was built next to an, a pre-existent Arab community called al Shajara, and those two names are very similar. Sejira was named after al Sajara and eventually became known as Ilanya. Um, al Sajara and Sejira, the two communities, Jewish and, and Arab, uh, lived quite harmoniously in the first part of the 20th century. And, um, uh, you know, th life seemed to be pretty good, certainly better than um, previous experiences they'd had. Um, until the creation of the State of Israel in 1948. And um, at that point, uh, the Israeli military uh, depopulated al Shajara um, and the Arab people were forced off the land. And so it represents, in the history, it's represented um, violence and the cycle of violence and oppression. Oppressor, the oppressed become the oppressor. Um, and obviously the Israel-Palestine situation is very complicated and very political, and I'm not going to unpack that whole thing uh, today. Um, but, but suffice it to say that I think hidden away behind the comfort and the ideal um, of the community of Elanya is a story of injustice and a story of oppression. There's still a military base, an Israeli military base, uh, right next to Elanya, which doesn't get a mention in that video, doesn't get a mention actually on the Jesus Trail uh, website, but representative of that action that took place, uh, that injustice when people were forcibly moved off the land in 1948. Um, we have a whole history represented here that dates back to the time of Jesus and beyond. In, you know, after, after Jesus' time, uh, uh, for the remainder of the Romo Roman Empire, there was such awful oppression and suppression that the, um, this area of Palestine became depopulated with Jewish people and other, other groups moved in. Um, and then throughout um, the, the history of the Middle Ages with the, the Crusades and uh, oppression of Jewish people in European cities and forcibly thrown out, um, at times, and, and then later the, the pogroms and the, uh, eventually the Holocaust in, in Germany, uh, just unbelievable atrocities and injustices committed against Jewish people. There was a movement over the years of, of Jewish people back into this territory. And, and again, initially, um, it wasn't violent, it wasn't oppressive, it was, um, there was a lot of cooperation, a lot of um, uh, working together, um, Jewish uh, people side by side with Arab people. Um, but at, at, with the rise of Zionism and the eventual foundation of the State of Israel, um, under the control of other empires, for instance, in, um, at the end of the Second World War, the, the area of transferred power was, was transferred um, from the Ottoman Empire to become a mandate of the British Empire. Um, and you know, these, these empires vying for control and dominance of this area really wreaked havoc. And, and, and with, with the decisions to create a state of Israel because of so much persecution in the 20th century, um, and especially the Holocaust, the creation of the state of Israel was intended to be peaceful. It was intended to be cooperative, um, but it resulted in violence perpetrated against Arab people. And then we've had the Arab-Israeli conflict ever since then. Again, complicated, difficult history, difficult story. It's replicated in the uh, that community of um, La Vie that I was telling you about, that, that orthodox kibbutz at the end of this part of the trail. Uh, there was a, uh, that again was a, a, a community established by uh, refugees from Great Britain, actually, Jewish refugees from Britain um, in the early part of the 20th century and uh, established next to an Arab community. And then in 1948, that Arab community was depopulated. Um, and, and so we have that, there's a memorial actually to the Holocaust at La, um, La Vie. Um, so you have the the sense of um, people being oppressed, but also oppressing others. And it's, it's, it's a complicated, difficult history and difficult story. The reason I want to bring it up um, today is, is because I want to um, ask us, ourselves um, three questions around this issue of injustice. And we, we, you know, we talk a lot about nature. We also talk a lot about injustice. And, um, but Jesus walked really close to injustice. And when we, when we listen to Jesus' teachings about um, breaking the, silent, the, the cycle of violence uh, that has been going on in this area since then, um, time and time again, we've just, we've just heard about that cycle, violence begetting violence. When we, um, 
when we think about Jesus's teaching, when we listen, listening, we're listening to Jesus's teaching, he's saying that in a context of unbelievable oppression, the Roman road representing that. He's walking that road. He's walking really close to it all. And it, it, this is very real. And Jesus is bringing hope and light into the darkness, into the cycle of, of violence. And uh, perhaps we've never really taken Jesus seriously. Perhaps we've never dreamed it could be possible. Um, and and we, we, we're just resigned to the fact that, that uh, when violence is committed against people, those people very often commit violence uh, um, against others and, and um, the cycle will, will be repeated. I look though with hope to people like Howard Thurman, Martin Luther King, who took the teaching of Jesus seriously uh, and influenced by many other people too, but, but primarily for them as followers of Jesus, they took the teaching of Jesus seriously and said, we don't just want to um, uh, create another cycle. Um, we're going to pursue nonviolence in the way of Jesus. And, and they got that from Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. In chapter 5, um, it says, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? So here Jesus is telling us that it's possible to find a way out of this cycle of violence. And, you know, I think we listen to that and it's, it's, we've heard it before. We talk about this a lot, right? And um, it sounds nice and it's, it, it, it sort of sounds like a platitude. It sounds like an ideal, but can we pursue it? Can we make it a reality? Is there any hope for humanity that, to break out of this cycle of violence and oppression? Um, Jesus is saying yes. And it's Jesus saying yes in a context of violence and oppression. He's not being idealistic about it. And I think in Ilanya, this community, we have kind of a visual image, if you like, on this trail of the, the, the idyllic um, scenario, the idyllic setting somewhat buffering us from the history, from the injustice that has been perpetrated. Okay, there was an, another community that existed there um, 60, 70 years ago, and it's been depopulated, and that's not right. It doesn't matter how, how idyllic it may seem now. Um, in fact, the, the it, ideal or idyllic nature of the existence there now can perhaps buffer um, us from that history of injustice. And, um, and, and that might be true in our own lives. We might be buffered from injustice. We may not experience injustice the way some people do. Um, and because of that, we're not as tuned into it and it's not as deep a concern for us, but it's a deep concern for Jesus. This is what Jesus wants to do. This is what Jesus is bringing us to, to partner with God and being agents of love, peace and hope. So it's, it's very hopeful, um, but it's a, it's a huge struggle. Um, and so I just want to ask three questions as we reflect on this, as we, as we if you like, we walk the road of love with Jesus. Um, and the first question is this. In what ways do we seek to dominate in our own lives? And, you know, we may not feel, we're not Roman emperors, we're not centurions, we're not um, commanders of armies and that kind of thing. But in our relationships, in our communication, in the way we handle ourselves, are we behaving compassionately, tenderly, gently? Um, are, we, um, are we communicating out of love? Are we seeking to be... Uh, to understand before we're seeking to be understood. Are we, are we trying to control and manipulate? Um, again, I'm not accusing either myself or anybody of this, but just saying, could we honestly reflect on this in light of Jesus's teaching? Now, I don't think Jesus is in any way saying, you need to be, you know, let people walk all, all over you or just be nice, uh, just keep the peace. I don't think Jesus is saying that at all. In fact, in Matthew 10, Jesus says, um, do not suppose that I've come to bring peace to the earth, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Um, that could be 
dangerously misinterpreted as Jesus advocating violence. But Jesus is clearly using hyperbole and, and metaphor to say, if you follow me, uh, you, you're going to make life uncomfortable, both for yourself and probably some people around you. You know, you're going to bring the sword of the word, the sword of of nonviolent resistance into situations that's going to be may even cost you your life, like it cost Jesus. That may uh, create pain and difficulty initially on this pathway, on this trail to peace and justice. Um, so it's not about being a pushover, and and, and nonviolence is is active it's intentional it's courageous it's it's way more courageous than violence um, so this is not about being being uh, walked over or pushed around but but you know whether it's bullying tactics or passive aggressive tactics could we examine our own lives and think like in what way do we need to uh, walk this road of, of love with Jesus more in, in our everyday relationships and our everyday encounters so that's one question for us to reflect on secondly does our desire for comfort inhibit our willingness to face injustice? So we just talked there about Jesus saying, you know, it's going to be, if you follow me, it's going to be uncomfortable. I, I think we're almost addicted to comfort, though, in our culture. Um, I, I know I am. I, I, I don't like to um, rock the boat. I don't particularly like change. Uh, I certainly don't want to have to face my wrongdoings or, uh, or even engage with my guilt. Um, and so when it comes to injustice, um, it's very easy for me to, um, to, to explain it away, um, to, to buffer myself from it in a way that Jesus didn't or couldn't because Jesus lived with it. Um, and for many of us, we can't buffer it. We can't separate ourselves from injustice because we are subject to injustice. Many of us um, are subject to racial injustice in, in, our, in our culture and uh, we, we can't escape it. Um, but people like me, um, have the privilege of being able to escape it. But are we willing to face it? Are we willing to go to that uncomfortable place? Um, are we willing to listen to the cry of the oppressed, to, uh, to, 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 to people who are saying, I am oppressed, um, I'm experiencing um, oppression, I'm experiencing injustice. Can we empathetically listen and engage rather than running away, rather than explaining away. And obviously we're on this journey together as a church, and that's an uncomfortable journey. And even talking about it is, is uncomfortable, but let's be courageous. Um, let's, let's transcend our politics and our political affiliations. And as we follow Jesus to pursue justice, be willing to go to a place of discomfort. So let's ask ourselves that, that question. Um, just like there's certain comforts in the, um, the uh, community of uh, Iliana, um, are we uh, hiding behind that comfort and uh, instead of uh, coming out from it and embracing uh, uh, the call of Jesus for, for justice? And then finally, we can't change the past. None of us can do that. But can we take ownership? And there's this tragic history uh, to the areas we're walking on on this trail this week. Um, some of it's hidden, some of it's more obvious. If you walk and if you walk past that military base, it'll be more obvious. But in, in Ilania and maybe even in La Vie, it's not so obvious um, immediately. But there's this tragic history um, that, that's the backdrop to, the, to uh, this trail. And um, again, Jesus comes to this tragedy with hope. Uh, with um, a call to be agents of love, peace and hope, to break the cycle of violence. But I think to do that, we have to own that history. Um, I say that as a British person who uh, comes from a country where people would just uh, get on a boat, go anywhere in the world and put a flag in the ground and say, right, this is ours now, um, and, uh, and start moving people off the land and oppressing people and enslaving people. And so, um, you know, I, you know, we, we have to come to the terms as British people with empire. And I think until we come to terms with it, until we own it, it's very people to t difficult for people to take us seriously um, in uh, that we really want to do something about it. It's like if you, if you have an argument with somebody or somebody has wronged you, you don't just want to hear, oh, sorry, you know, sorry about that. You want to hear somebody say, I realize what happened. I realize what I did and I'm, I'm, I'm taking ownership of that. When somebody does that, the likelihood of change happening is much higher. And so for reconciliation to happen, there has to be some kind of ownership, especially as we think about 
um, empire and colonialism and, and, and racism, racial injustice, there has to be some ownership. And we, the temptation, I think, for people like me, um, especially for white people, is to think, well, I, I didn't perpetrate that injustice. I wasn't there. That's not my history. That's not my story. And we kind of remove ourselves from it in a way that is um, inappropriately disowning it. Um, and, you know, somebody used an, gave me this analogy. I don't know where they got it from. It's not an original thought, but uh, they likened it to owning a house, a house that's been passed down through generations uh, from family to family, you know, to, within the same family. Um, and by the time we inherit it, it's broken down, it's rat infested, it's got all, all kinds of problems with it. And we could just say, um, not our problem, uh, and, and um, you know, point the finger at the previous generations and say, well, they did it, that's what they did. But it's our house, we own it, it's ours. And so we have to take ownership, we have to do something about it. And that was a helpful analogy to me of not about uh, uh, blame. It's not about just trying to be feel guilty and, and that maybe will sort of be a salve to us or something like that, but saying, no, there's history here. There's a story here. We need to know the story. We need to understand the story in order for us to be able to move forward um, and make amends and, and uh, to repair the breach and to bring healing and to bring reconciliation. So, uh, you know, our tendency is not to go to that uh, place of discomfort. We, we, we just rem let history be a buffer, maybe let our comfort levels in life now just uh, soothe us into uh, inaction. But that's not the way of Jesus. That's not the road that Jesus trod. That's not the trail that we're walking on with Jesus. So again, I offer these as questions, not in any way accusing anybody, um, but put them out there as challenges that I personally want to reflect on. And as we come to communion now, we're gonna leave these questions up and let's just take a moment of silence to reflect on them, um, invite Jesus to challenge us in our own lives and, um, and then we'll, we'll uh, eat the bread and, and drink the wine together um, as, as we take communion.